Hey two cousins, it's Rusty. In today's video, we're going to be looking at a variety of jewelry. We're going to be examining stuff, talking about specific metals, and we'll play a couple of games. This or that, that's where you decide which one you think is more valuable, and a new game that we're putting in this video for the very first time. Make sure, too, to stick around. At the end of this video, I'm going to give you a little piece of knowledge that I have learned this year that is going to dramatically change the way that I do business in the coming year and it will probably help you too. You may or may not be aware, um, different types of the cases for pocket watches can be made of um, what they call rolled gold or a gold filling uh, or solid gold. It, the same applies to the chains that um, would be attached to a pocket watch. This one is, uh, is very old. It's probably mid to late 1800s. You can see that it is monogrammed here with people's initials in script. This is whoever this belonged to originally, <clears throat> or maybe it was given to them as a gift. And then here's the, the portion that would clip onto the pocket watch itself. If it's made of gold or gold filled, a lot of times it will say it right here. In this particular case, it just says the brand name, and that is Simmons. I was pretty uh, certain that this was either gold filled or solid gold, so I took it in. Um, they did a test on it and verified that it is actually 10 carats solid gold. So this has value, folks. A lot of times, whenever I get pocket watches with chains, I will remove the chain and I will sell the chain separately because chains by themselves can hold some decent value, also can be made of gold. And I've found that in selling pocket watches, I do not necessarily make any more money when I sell a pocket watch that comes with a chain versus does not come with a chain. It's it's essentially the same price and they're getting a chain as well. But I, make, I maximize my money if I sell a chain by itself. These three pieces are also very interesting in of themselves. This particular piece I'm going to show you, it's just a little pendant and it's a cross. And as I pull it up here, you will see marks. Oh, doggone, yes, in the light. We need the light here. You can see that it says S and K. And then right there, that mark is three, seven, or G and K, I guess, rather, three, seven, five. Remember how a moment ago I said, make sure you know three, seven, five, five, eight, five, seven, five, zero. Well, three, seven, five is actually the European hallmark for nine karat gold. They make nine karat gold? Well, yes, they did, and sometimes they still do. So this is gold, solid gold, but it is a, about the lowest. I think that there's eight carat out there as well, but this is about one of the lowest purities uh, as far as the the amount of this, which is gold, um, but still carries more value than something that does not have gold. And also the fact that it's marked helps. I'll probably hold this until I have a, a gold chain to go with it, and I'll try to sell those and maximize that value. This is cool. Uh, this is missing the stone. It either, it either fell out or somebody harvested it. But this was, at one point in time, you can see a 1934. This was a 1934 class ring. And on the inside here, when we're looking for something, we see SP0 or SPO. And those would have been, or SRO, those would have been initials of the person who this belonged to. But this is what's funny right here. On the inside right there, what does it say? It says, I don't know if you'll be able to see it in the light. Well, maybe you'll be able to see it just without. Yeah, gold. <laughs> it doesn't say a purity amount. It doesn't say 14K or 18K. It just says gold. Well, you know what that tells me is if they had to stamp it, then um, and they wanted you to know that it was gold, it's likely gold-filled, right? It's not likely to be solid gold because if it was, it would give the purity amount, 10 carat, 14 carat. And I was missing the stone. I'm going to do a scratch test on it and find out how much it is. If it's just gold filled, I'll throw it in with some other gold filled jewelry. If it's solid gold, I'll sell it for the weight. This particular piece, I think it's quite interesting. <clears throat> Done a lot of research on this. On the inside, you can see that, uh, you know, it's fairly flat. It's fairly, fairly heavy for what it is. Not terribly heavy. But if you look around the inside, there is no mark. Right, I had this tested and it came out as 10 carat solid gold. 
<clears throat> between nine and ten gear. There's a variance there uh, in this in this one, and sometimes others. To be uh, marked a certain amount, that it has to be. There is a small variation that they allow for variance in the actual uh, exact purity. But this particular ring, which happens to fit on my finger, I'll put it on here so you can see it, is what they call the Iron Cross. Um, an Iron Cross uh, came about. Um, back in the early, early 1800s, <clears throat> when the king uh, or the, the ruler of, of the Prussia government uh, created this and then used it for military. This is during the uh, Neapol uh, Napoleonic Wars. And whenever I did research on this, I could not find any like this. This was also reused later on by uh, other German forces, including the, the Nazi Germany era. But I, the ones from that era do not look like this. And uh, I've talked with a couple other people. It's looking like this actually may be from the early 1800s. This may actually be from that, you know, 1813 to 1817, 1819 um, era. We don't know for sure, and there's no mark on it. But given what it is, it's history, uh, quite interesting. So I'm going to hold on to this and price it real high and see if there are any collectors who would want it. And if they don't buy it any time in the next, you know, two to three months, we might start lowering the price till we can get her sold. Next, cousins, I wanted to show you a couple of beautiful cameo pieces that we just got in. <clears throat> Definitely paid up for these, but I think that we can very easily double our money. What you're looking at are pieces of coral, all right, which is from the ocean, <clears throat> that have been carved out. Uh, and, and the bust or like a side profile of a woman or, or a man or someone is very common, probably the most common. The reason I picked these up were <clears throat> they were at the same place. I got a decent deal on them. This one is in very, very, they're both in very, very good condition. The the work on the gold around to hold these in is actually <clears throat> done quite nice, very smooth. Sometimes they're really messy and not real nice. This one, woman's wearing a hat, and that's, uh, it's kind of uncommon. You don't see that as often. This one is more solid around the edges. As you can see, this one is more like a filigree type situation, <clears throat> but they are both made from 14 karat gold. How do you know that, Rusty? Well, you're always looking on the back. That's where you find most of your information is on the back of these things. And it could be anywhere, right? So I'm always looking at if there's a, if it's a pendant or a brooch, I'm going to look around the the, uh, the pin, the clasp, the little, the little ball here to hang it from a necklace. <clears throat> if I don't see anything there, I'll look around the inside, even around the edge like this. There's really no telling. In this case, these are both marked exactly in the same spot, and that is right on the edge here where my thumbnail is, where this pin wouldn't be secured. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily think to look there, and that's a very, it's very small, but let me show you these so that you know what it looks like. So I'm gonna take my, my loop here, pull it up, and you can see in the light, right? Let me, it's very smudgy. You can see it says 14K right there. I wonder if I switch that around, it may be a little bit easier for you to see. Yeah, 14, you see that right there? It's marked right where the pin goes in. And then on this one over here, same situation. If I bring it up here, 14K. Now that's really tiny. People, Most people with their regular eyesight would not be able to see that. I, Rusty used to be very fortunate to have real good eyesight, so a lot of times I don't even need a loop. But uh, in this case, it was helpful to have one. I always bring one with me as, long, as well as a magnet. So you're gonna check the metal first, see if it's magnetic. That'll tell you right away if it is or is not um, gold or silver. And then look for the marks. These both together, uh, this one probably could sell for as much as $1,400 by itself. This one's probably going to be more in the seven dollars or $800 range. As a pair, I would not accept less than $2,000 for these two pieces. Um, so that's pretty good. If I sold these two for $2,000, that would um, over double my money, which is what we were looking for. Let's play a game, shall we? Welcome back to How To, Rusty. To Rusty How To, How To Do. This or that. It's a game. Rusty How To. It's going to be so much fun. On this edition of This or That, we have this large gold uh, tone link uh, necklace here with something that looks like maybe a stone here. Um... 
and uh, and then this little clasp here at the end, all right, and then or that, which is this other gold tone bracelet. Um, you can see I paid twelve dollars for it, but um, with this this sort of like clasp here, like that. So which do you think is more valuable, this bracelet or this large heavy necklace? If you guess <clears throat> that this bracelet is worth more then you are correct. So the interesting thing about these two items are that I bought them on the same day <clears throat> at the same thrift store. I paid $10 for this uh, necklace and I paid $12 for this bracelet. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little something about how I operate and that is sometimes folks, if I have a, uh, a sneaky suspicion that something may be worth quite a bit more, but I can't quite tell in the store, sometimes I'll take a risk and I'll spend a little bit of money. <clears throat> Usually $10 is my max. I went to 12 on this, so I spent $22, hoping that one of these was gonna be made of gold. Whenever I uh, got this particular bracelet, which I'll show you up close, you can see it's a nice, very heavy. Whenever I was able to get this unclasped from here, I noticed that there was a mark on one side of this clasp and that got me excited because I thought oh boy here we go let's see what this little sucker looks like here if we can um I don't know if it's going to show it or not here we go mate I got a different loop here this will be a lot better look at this look at this what this says here if you can see it in the light it says metal <laughs> with two l's metal oh thank goodness I, I was wondering if maybe this was made of <clears throat> Plastic. I'm just joking. It's so heavy, folks. I knew it was made of metal. But when it says metal, that means it's worth. It's not made of a precious metal. All right. It's made of a very basic metal. Um, it, and, and upon further inspection, the the look of this particular piece makes it look like it's plated. It, it looks like plating to me. This stone uh, is set in there, but it it just it does not look like a genuine gemstone. It looks like a plastic rhinestone to me. So this was a bust, <clears throat> $10, that's not too much to spend. Uh, this, if it had been solid gold, would have probably weighed, oh my goodness, over 100 grams. So if this was like, say, 14 karat gold, and it was weighed over over 100 grams, this would have been, you know, you know, six figures easily in value. And now we turn to this one. <clears throat> I had a sneaky suspicion, but I couldn't tell until I got back here to the warehouse. Now. If I look this uh, real close, you might see something that looked like little indentations here. Well, folks, that was the spot where I found out that I, I had made the right choice. So if I grab this loop again, <clears throat> wherever I laid it down, here it is. And we pull this up here, you're gonna see, first off over here, it has a little mark. It looks like initials, like just a certain, I can't quite see that, but right here you'll see it says 585. There it is. 585. And the thing that's important, and maybe that says, it looks like a K. Looks like an S and a K. But this says 585. 585 is the European hallmark for 14 karat gold. I have also had this tested. It is, in fact, solid gold. It weighs about 32 grams. So we're looking at somewhere in the $1,150 of just scrap gold weight in this. And this only cost me 12 bucks, folks. <clears throat> so I would say that sometimes it is worth taking a risk. I mean, I paid $22 for the two of these. One, I'll throw in a lot of costume jewelry and I'll sell it. The, the big chains and the gold tone will, will be a kind of an eye, uh, you know, make, make the rest of the stuff pop and more attractive. This, however, is gonna really, really, uh, you know, make, make some decent money. And the thing is, folks, you need to know your hallmarks. You need to know what 375, 585, 750, these are all European hallmarks for different carat purities of gold. Time for a brand new segment, folks. This one's called, Can You Name It? Can you name it? Can you name it? Can you name it? Or not? Well, folks, we got an absolutely brand new uh, segment called, uh, can you name it? And so I'm going to pull these up here real quick and let you look. <clears throat> 
You, you say, Rusty, that's a ring. Well, yeah, you're right. Okay, that's not the question. The question is, what do you think that this stone is? And so I'm going to pull it up here. I'm going to try to move it around the light. This is not the best light in the world. Now, what are you seeing there? You're seeing kind of some flashes of some yellow, a little bit of orange possibly, but also this darker tone. Move that around. She's kind of dark, but kind of got that yellowish, orangish hue. <clears throat> well, folks, if you said that is a smoky topaz, well, you'd be correct. This is seven, 18 karat uh, gold. It's a ring. It's probably, yeah, it's right around a size five and three quarters to six, um, which is all right. Um, you know, usually under size six, there are fewer women that, that wear that size. That sort of six to seven, seven and a half is the most common, but this is a vintage piece. Um, it's nice. It comes in this really cool little uh, pack, a little uh, ring holder. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> ring holders like this, really old ones, don't ever toss those. They can sell by themselves for really good money. And then moving over to this, can you name it? So the question now is, this particular type of, of colored thing here in there that's real shiny like, do you see that? It's kind of got this rust kind of brownish uh, kind of tint to it, but it's real, it's real sparkly. I'm going to bring this up here and show you as well. This is what we're looking at. It's something like this. It has this flash as you move it around in the light. You see that, how sparkly that is? What do you think that is? Can you name it? Well, folks, what you're looking at here is something called goldstone. Goldstone. Now, do they call it goldstone because it has little flecks of gold in it? Well, in fact, no. No, that is not gold. Well, do they call it a stone, Rusty, because it's it's a stone that kind of looks like it has flecks of gold in it? Well, folks, no. It's not a stone. It's not gold, and it's not a stone. That's what they call a misnomer. <laughs> this is actually a synthetic type of glass made in like a low oxygen environment, and they've used it as sort of like a synthetic uh, gemstone, uh, rhinestone type thing, but it is not naturally occurring. It is, <clears throat> it is manufactured, and what you're seeing is this in an actual piece of vintage jewelry. This is kind of like a uh, like a oh, uh, like a pocket watch type fob. Again, you can see the same type of clasp like we saw earlier. It's not made of gold. It's not made of a precious metal. It's got this in it. It's definitely kind of like a floral, almost like an Art Nouveau attempt. Uh, at this here, but it's quite neat. These can actually sell decently in themselves, but another indication that this is not made of a precious material is you can see this kind of greenish uh, type of a sort of a metal uh, deterioration going on here. Um, and uh, and so that needs to be like cleaned off, polished off of that, but it could definitely sell decently. These things uh, can sell, but don't be a uh, fool. This is not a, a naturally occurring item, although it is uh, quite, quite striking when you actually uh, turn it around in the light. These came into the warehouse this week, and I wanted to bring them to your attention because uh, a lot of people may not know that old medals or old awards that came out either in the military, which is what these are from, or uh, other things like sports or different things can actually be made of precious metals, gold or silver. In this case, you'll see as I turn some of these over that right here on the bottom, we have the word sterling, sterling, sterling. Sterling. So these are made of sterling silver. And the reason I tell you this is that these, being military medals for, uh, for kind of um, awards for passing certain tests, carbine, machine gun, and pistol, uh, these have value in themselves. Collectors collect these. But if they weren't, let's say it was from like the 1960s or something, and it was someone's, uh, you know, swimming medal or something like that, and you think no one would care about that, you might be right. People may not be collecting those for what they are specifically, but alternatively, if you would want to sell it to someone who collects a sterling silver or, or even a, uh, someone who's a jeweler who will take that piece that no one cares about anymore because it, it you know its use is sort of gone they can turn that back into silver uh, for something new 
Next thing I wanted to show you today, everyone, is this necklace that just came in. This cost basically nothing because it came in with a large lot of costume jewelry, and that jewelry has already sold, and we've made our money on it. This I pulled out because what you're looking at here is actually a coral bead necklace. These are small beads, but they are this kind of um, almost like a salmon color. Um, it needs to be polished up and cleaned up a little bit here because some of these are kind of, you know, kind of scuffed up kind of grungy um it's an interesting piece here this has kind of been um sort of put together here and uh, there's no clasp on it it's 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 a long necklace you would wrap it twice kind of like this to put around someone's neck but coral folks i want you to know coral sells really well particularly angel skin coral which is like a soft pink color but this will go quite nicely I, I find these in costume jewelry all the time because people think that they're just plastic beads but these are actually this was a living organism at one time and uh, people have been using things like bone and coral and sh mother of pearl and things like that some of the earliest things used in jewelry for those of you who are not aware, things in the Tabakiana category have some very avid collectors. And this just came into the warehouse here. Um, it is a pipe. It's from a, a town, a village um, called um, Eskisahir. I don't know if that's, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it is from Turkey. Um, this particular type of <clears throat> pipe material is called meerschaum it's a white it comes in a very bright stark white color they find it along the coasts and other places that dig it up in turkey primarily and it is um a type of uh, smoking vessel now in contrast to briar wood which is a root it's the ball of a bush uh, that they would dig up out of the ground and then they would carve around that's what most higher quality or even mid quality of pipes are made out of but meerschaum this white um, you can see this one has uh, has uh, changed color over time i'll explain that in a moment but essentially what happens is this is an incredibly porous uh, stone it's actually stone but it's also quite soft. And so they'll carve it, and they can carve it almost like you would carve marble. <clears throat> they can carve faces, they can carve uh, some other common ones would be like a, 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 a bird's claw, like a talon holding onto an egg. There's ones that are, look like golf balls. Um, there's a variety of different ones, and they've been using meerschaum for, for just ages as a smoking, as something to smoke through tobacco. So what'll happen is they'll cure it with whale blubber and beeswax. And, and when you start smoking that tobacco in there, there's this inverse reaction where it's going to suck the dark, uh, like the color essentially from uh, the tobacco. And uh, it, you know, it's going to suck um, towards the bowl. It's going to suck that beeswax and that um, whale blubber. And then you're going to be sucking the, um, the tobacco tar is going to be coming into. And so it's sucking. So this color right here, this is coloration from the, the, the actually from the tobacco itself, because this is a porous material. It's sucking it in here. People who uh, smoke these for a long time or who are, um, you know, professionals at, at doing it to cure it in a particular way can achieve some just incredible looks depending on what they've carved here. So without further ado, this pipe is, is, is vintage. It is from Turkey. It is actual meerschaum. I believe that it is a, a block meerschaum versus composite. That means uh, they didn't, you know, obliterate it into a powder and then reassemble it. This is actually a solid piece and it has just been carved out of. And you've got a woman here, a nude woman, um, you know, popping up out of here. I don't know what she's doing, where she's from. But uh, they've carved this sort of these little etched motifs in here uh, just to kind of give it a little extra flair, I guess. Um and you can see it's been heavily used. This right here is a lucite, that's a type of plastic a stem, and it is a replacement. This is not the original stem. In fact, inside of here, they've put this little plastic insert and, and so that this stem could fit. You always wanna turn it one direction, both in and out, so you don't mess up if there happens to be threading in there, which there isn't threading in this one. I could just push it in, but anyhow, uh, 
this is a newer stem. It has been used, but if it was you know, uh, cleaned correctly, it could be reused. These things can sometimes sell for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on how old and how rare it is. I've seen others like this, uh, but this is vintage. I think about the newest this could possibly be would be like the, the mid to early 1970s, but it could be from the 1800s. I'm just not sure. This is an, a newer... And by newer, I mean still probably 40 or 50 years old, but it's not from the 1800s, this case. So it could be a replacement case, just like the stem is a replacement. I don't know, but we're going to do pretty well on that. Do not neglect pipes. Um, not all Meerschaum pipes are going to be rare. Like I said, you should do your research, find out what's most common. And if you ever come across one that is very, very unique or odd, those sell the best. This beauty just came in. I want to talk about it for a moment. Because certain ones can sell for uh, gobs of money. What you're looking at here right now is the, the spine definitely has some trouble. I'm going to see if I can repair that without this ugly piece of tape. But um, clearly the spine's got trouble. But this is an antique album. But instead of uh, photographs on paper, these are what they call tin types. Now there's a variety of different um, types of photograph from back in this era. And this is definitely <clears throat> Civil War era. You got tin types, you got something called daguerreotypes, you got something called ambrotypes. One of those uh, has to do with being mounted or, or basically uh, being on glass. One of these types, tin types, are magnetic, so a, a um, it will you know be attracted by a magnet, whereas a daguerreotype will not. So the first thing I'm going to do is take in order to figure out is a little magnet here, and I'm going to see does it connect. Why, yes, it does. So this is a tin type. It's a young man here in a nice little kind of coat with a little, uh, little tie there. Oh, look at this. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. We got a revenue stamp, internal revenue, proprietary. That's on the back of the next one. And that is a gentleman here. Let's see, is this one magnetic? Yes, it is. He's sitting at a chair. This is a, staged in, a, in a someone's studio, as you can see. Look at this. It's got some crackling going on here, but it also attracted. So this is a tin type as well. And a woman. As we move further in, this is old Mr. Charles Blake. If you didn't already know, <clears throat> moving through here, we got other men. Another one in a studio, a couple gentlemen, one standing, one sitting. Ah, uh, here we go. Now we're getting to the exciting stuff. Folks, if you're not aware, old tintypes and daguerreotype photographs of men in uniform from early uh, periods in history, this particularly being the Civil War. This is in a studio, but man, look, he's got his entire jacket and his hat on there. His whole outfit, again, this is a tintype because it is magnetic. Gonna move on in. Here's another gentleman with military uh, outfit on. He's sitting... Here's another gentleman here. This thing is chock full. Here's another man who's got a military uniform on those, those buttons. Just awesome. We've got another, uh, you know, internal revenue proprietary stamp here. That's a one cent. And just keeps them moving. Folks, this is a really cool. I think there's somewhere around 15 photographs in here. Only one woman. But these could be sold individually or they can be sold in a group. Since this is in here, I'd like to try to sell it as a group if I can. But keep a lookout for these. Ones that are odd, again, bizarre, or ones who, uh, with individuals in military uniforms, sell for the most. Hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in some case. I was out at a local thrift store recently looking for postcards, and I came across <clears throat> these. I'm going to lay some of these out. Some of you may already know what these are. Others of you do not. But what these are, folks, clearly they're photographs. They're very old. They're from the 1800s, about <clears throat> mid to late 1800s. These are what they call cabinet cards. Cabinet cards come in a variety of sizes, sometimes small like this. I can hold it in my hand. Other times quite large. But they're put, they're, they're a photograph, photographic paper, but they're on something that's a little bit harder. These are not terribly thick. Some are very thick, almost like... Uh, thicker, like harder than uh, and more dense than um, 
cardboard, but the idea was on, on people's uh, dressers or their vanities, they could just set these things up and look at them. They didn't have to go into an actual um, album. And so I was thinking that these were interesting, but what I really found interesting was when I turned them over to take a look, I found these. So this one, what these are, I'm going to flip them all over so you can see them. There are different colors. You can see blues, greens, blue, 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 green, and green here. So what we're looking at, we got two cent, three cent stamps here, and they say different things. So this one, for example, says internal revenue, internal rev, U.S. inter rev. Okay, and it says playing cards at the bottom. This one says bank check. What we got over here, this one says playing cards. This one says proprietary. What do we got over here? Proprietary telegraph. Proprietary. So there's a variety of different kinds and colors. So these are all uh, George Washington. We got two cent and three cent. They come in one cent. They come in a variety of different uh amounts and they'll say different things on them like i just showed you these are called revenue stamps revenue stamps were um a thing back in the 1800s in fact one of these says it very proudly on here let me see which one it is ah oh, here we go the cancellation shows that it was canceled in 18 it's either 1865 or 1885 it's looking like an eight 1885 cancellation on this so these are quite old um, revenue stamps were basically something that a business would put on an item to show that they paid their taxes, um, for, for the, that item. Now, why they needed to put them on these photographs as they saw, uh, uh, before they sold them, um, I don't know the answer to that. But you're going to see revenue stamps on other types of items. I have some old paper ephemera that have revenue stamps on them, um, that, like from like legal documents that showed that taxes were paid when uh, services were rendered and the, the, you know, the individuals were paid for their work. Uh, I've seen those. And they can go, they can be as high as you know, $50, $100, which back in 1885 was a ton of money. But I show you this to say revenue stamps, particularly the higher the, the value, the higher the number, and certain things that they say on them can mean way more value. Some of these things sell for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for a single stamp. No joke. I'll show you that here in just a little bit. But keep a lookout for this stuff. Yes, the photograph can be valuable in and of itself or the postcard or whatever the document is, but the stamp could also be your ticket to a really nice payday. I wanted to show you this, folks, again, to tell you that these things can have value. I paid $35 for this, and what we're going to be looking at here, folks, is an antique scrapbook from the 1800s. They're all sort of similar in the sense that a lot of these will have what they call quote unquote die cuts. So that would be uh, a picture of something in color that has been cut out in the shape of the thing. Those are used for advertising a lot of times and also just for decorative purposes. This particular scrapbook, folks, is all like this. It's coming primarily from newspaper clippings of people, of famous people, of interest in looking people. Uh, back during this time period, of course, travel was very, very uh, difficult and took a lot of time because they didn't have airplanes and such. And so if you wanted to go to other parts of the world, you were going to get on a ship and you were going to travel for you know, days and or weeks. And a lot of people never got out of their area. So when they could see photographs of far off places or distant lands or interesting looking people, they were very, very curious about that. So what we're seeing here are all these different people and... Um, you can see, above all, honestly, just the fashion of the day, which was pretty incredible. What we're looking here is like a lot of, of you know, people in ballet. We've got maybe some different um, people who are um, maybe um, in royal families or things like that from other parts of the world. What we got here? We've got wedding clothes as herself. This is a character, so these are actresses. Here are some musicians, it looks like. Pretty awesome. Very large, very large um, <clears throat> pictures, uh, you know, people from newspaper clippings. And it just goes on and on. This is still a bunch of actors, it looks like. 
We've got other people here. William Bryant. This gentleman sitting in his chair. I mean, just look at the way that the, the room was um, decorated at that time. This thing, I don't, I haven't looked at and counted how many pages are in here, but recently eBay made an update where you can now upload 24 pictures per listing and not just 12. Uh, I don't know if that's just for people who have a certain um, subscription uh, to, to eBay or if anyone can, but that's really going to help me in this case because I want to try to take as many photos as I possibly can. Uh, these scrapbooks are uh, definitely highly collectible for some people. And I don't know exactly right now what people are looking for the most, if they're really wanting the die cuts or if they're wanting stuff like this. Some people will get these and cut the die cuts out. And I've been known to do that too, if, if a particular book is so degraded that I don't think it can sell or if it sits up for a while and doesn't sell. Uh, but you got such cool looking stuff here, folks. I imagine if I do a little bit of extra um, snooping around and, and really looking closely at this stuff, I'll find some clues as to the exact age, or at least within maybe a five to ten year period. But I guarantee you this is from the 1800s. I mean, shoot, uh, here's Booker T. Washington. If I were to look uh, at some of the names of these people and just look up the time period that they lived in, Clearly, um, anyone who has, you know, if I saw, see the dates that they died, I would know that these were had, would probably had to have been put in before that. Look at this gentleman. He is Muhammad Ali, the Shah of Persia. It's Muhammad Ali, right there. Not the boxer, but the Shah. And this is His Imperial Highness, uh, the Vantahad, Crown Prince of Persia. Look at that sword, that Persian sword. Incredible, folks. Incredible stuff. So, actors, actresses, royal people. What a cool thing. And then we've got just more and more. It goes on and on and on. I won't bore you with it, guys, but I just, I eat this stuff up. Here's an example of a die cut. See, it's colored. It's cut out in a specific way. Look at that. Also, look at these old dots of the old glue that was in here. My goodness, I'm surprised that these all open so well like they do. This person spent a lot of time, put a lot of effort into making this book. And uh, really awesome. Who knows however many you know years or even decades that this was worked on. Could have been worked on by multiple people in a family. You never know. Keep a lookout for these folks. $35 is easy. I'll sell this for $100 or more all day long. As promised, if you've stuck around, I want to share something with you that I've decided for this coming year that is going to dramatically change my reselling business in 2023. We're in the end of December here. We're about to turn over a new page and our business is going to be doing something a bit different. Well, what is that? Well, I want to share a quick story with you. A couple weeks back, more like a month ago, I stepped into a thrift store just to look around and see if I could find something. I ended up having a conversation with the manager at this store. That conversation led to a private showing of her showing me some jewelry and things that they had that they hadn't put out yet. I ended up making an offer and buying everything in that in the room in this person's office. And I've done very well on that so far. But we didn't stop there. We continued the conversation and I told her what I did for a living. And it occurred to me that there could be a possible relationship here that could be a win-win for both parties. So we uh, scheduled a time to get together. We had another conversation and this is how it went. I essentially proposed to this individual that when they get in items that they are curious might be worth, you know, more uh, than the average item donated to them or ones that they are for sure are more valuable, that instead of putting that out on the floor in this tiny little town with the small population of people to see it and potentially buy it, instead that there would be intervals where I would offer to sell this stuff on their behalf. It's great because it's a nonprofit thrift store. They are getting a worker, me, at no cost to themselves to sell items that were donated, so at no cost to them, and I'm going to be able to give them a global platform online to sell these items for you know faster and for more money than they could usually sell it for locally. And this is going to, I'm hoping, dramatically increase their revenue in a, in a given year. We worked out a percentage. I take a small percentage for my work, but they get the majority of that money. It's going to be a lot more than they would get otherwise, and they'll get it even more rapidly than they, they 
would just selling it on their own. It also helps out old Rusty because I've got work to be doing. I do get a percentage of that. And also, I'm not having to waste my time driving around, spending my gas money, just hoping I'm going to find something to make a profit on. This lends some stability to my business. If I know if once a month, twice a month, I can go and pick up items to be listed and make money on, then that takes the pressure off of me having to find stuff in the wild. There are a few things in this industry that are very difficult. Number one, costs are going up. It's difficult for me to make as much money when the costs are always getting higher. When I buy goods, they're more expensive than they used to be. Number two, competition. There are more people out trying to find these deals and I'm competing with not only luck of, I'm, I'm not just trying to luck into finding something, but I'm hoping to find it before someone else finds it and recognizes that it has value. And that's difficult. It's getting harder and harder to do. Well, Rusty can't change the price structure. Inflation goes up. People want more money. They need more money to pay their employees. And so the cost of the items goes up. I can't change that. There but, are, however, creative ways that you could work out situations in which you don't have the competition in the way that I described before. In my case, I'm going to be pursuing even more of these types of relationships with businesses that I can help benefit them with the items that they have, make them some money, make myself some money, and give myself some stability. Now, instead of driving around and hoping I find something and competing with everyone else, there's no competition. I'm the one who gets the phone call when stuff comes in. I'm the one that can go and, and adequately assess, analyze, critique, and determine a value of something, and then put it in a platform where they can maximize exposure. So I want you to consider that in this coming year. What's a way that maybe you and your community can beat out some competition, get yourself some consistent work, and hopefully help out a local business as well? I wish you all the luck during, and hopefully you get to spend some time with loved ones over this holiday season. We'll talk with you soon. Let's go find some treasures. Rusty, Rusty, Rusty Harem 2. Rusty, Rusty, Rusty Harem 2. Rusty, Rusty, Rusty Harem 2. Rusty, Rusty. Can you name it? Can you name it? Can you name it? Or not? Can you name it? Can you name it? Can you name it?